Welcome to So and So, brought to you by Bernina, made to create. I'm Meg Goodman, and you're about to enjoy a casual conversation with a special member of the sewist and quilting community. A conversation about how they got started, what inspires them, what excites them, and their connection to this community. Our guest today is Lynn Schmidt, owner of a different box of crayons, which is housed in an 1890s farmhouse in downtown Glen Ellen, Illinois. Lynn grew up in Chicago and initially went to Bradley University in Peoria as a fine arts major. She finished and graduated from the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts Roosevelt University with a BFA Fine Arts Interior Design. For the next 30 years, she practiced her design craft in Chicago, specializing in commercial interiors. During this time, she worked on the Delta Concourse at O'Hare Airport, which is now Terminal 3. She also worked on numerous banks, accounting and law firms, and some international projects in Kuwait and Egypt. Lynn began designing patterns while at A Touch of Amish, which is a quilt shop in Barrington, Illinois. And this went as far back as 2005. And these patterns were first published in 2006 in Fonz and Porter's magazine. After opening a different box of crayons in 2010, Lynn began designing patterns and kits for quilters using new techniques and interesting mixes of fabrics. She's been in several publications and has had many projects published in Needle Love Quilt Books. In her spare time, Lynn enjoys knitting, cross-country skiing, kayaking with her husband, truly anything outside, and of course, all crafts. She plans on picking up her paintbrushes and pastels again soon, as soon as she can embark on some mixed media art classes. Lynn currently makes her home in Glen Ellen with her husband, Jerry Gallagher. Hi, Lynn, and welcome to So and So. Hi, Meg. How are you? I am good. You do a lot of things. As we've <laughs> discussed before we, we hit record, um, you're busy. Yeah, crazy busy, actually. <laughs> crazy busy. And we're, we're honored that we were able to, to put this time aside to, to talk to you, and we appreciate it very much. You grew up in Chicago. Uh, tell us about life as, as a child there and, and how you initially learned how to sew. Oh, how I initially learned how to sew. Wow, that's a, that's a challenging one. But, um, well, I grew up in the city, and, and I was a city kid for the most part, but I was actually very privileged. My uh, grandparents had a cottage in northern Wisconsin. So as a result, I spent every summer from the, the time that I was born until I turned 16 and was told I needed to go to work because that's what we did. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically spent it barefoot running and um, in the lake and with a lot of free time, which involved climbing into trees and drawing pictures and imagination has gone wild and every art and craft that you could possibly figure. So really, in a way, that downtime in Wisconsin was kind of my foundation in a lot of handwork, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I find myself even now kind of going back to some of those things and going, why can't I put that part in with? And that's, that's a lot of where the foundation of where I am right now even sits. Mm -hmm. So did it impact? Yes, it impacted it a great deal. Um, growing up in the city, well, you had the advantage of an urban life. So there was that. It was the northern section of Chicago. So we were, you know, you had some of the pluses and the minuses and all that. But it was pretty well-rounded. I never knew what it was to be bored in the city. So it was a good thing. You know, it, it, you talk about climbing trees and running barefoot in, in the lake. What, what a wonderful childhood. But you, you were a risk taker. And, and I, it, from, from what I, I know of you, and we'll talk about this, um, this kind of uh, transcended your life into adulthood. So maybe those tree climbing adventures really <laughs> set you up for where you are now. <laughs> maybe, maybe. It's kind of like you don't think too much. You just go and you do. And that's, yeah, sure. that's kind of foundational. Now, um, your original occupation, you were an interior designer, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm guessing there are unmistakably many parallels to that vocation with what you do now. Um, would you tell us about some of them and, and um, talk about one of your favorite interior design projects? Well, it would be hard to figure out a, a favorite, to be honest, because each of them had something within it, which was unique, which is not different from what I'm doing now. Um, how are they similar? Well. It, it's actually pretty easy when you when you think about a floor plan. Because first and foremost, I was a space planner. 
And how is space planning any different from laying out a quilt top? You're looking at line and form, how things work together, the relationship between them. And of course, in the context of interiors, it's how do people ultimately work in these spaces. But then mm-hmm. it's like, okay, you have the connections. You, you, you know, there's a foundation to it. There's a grid, if you will, that you have to figure out how these things are going to interact with each other, which is not different from a quilt pattern. Um, but that doesn't mean that they all have to be rectangles and squares because that's when the creativity comes in and the exceptions come in. And how is that different from planning a quilt house? It's, it's really just a question mm-hmm. of scale. You know, we're dealing with volumes of space or areas of color and texture and, you know, all the details that you can put into it. And, of course, in the finishing part, even in an interiors project, is in the detail. It's always in the detail. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up within, within the auspices of an architectural firm, so I was very, very focused on details. And I'm even using things like that today. Like, what is a reveal? A reveal in cabinetry is when two different materials come together. Well, I'm using that same concept in planning new approaches to how you lay out a quilt top. You know, if you have something that's set on points versus straight set, those two dimensions do not physically work together. So what do you do? You create, in my world, a reveal or a spacer um, in quilt world, but it's a reveal in cabinet world. So it's kind of just, there's lots of overlap. It's all over the place. You know, that, that makes sense hearing you describe this kind, kind of coming in from a, a different angle. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's pretty obvious how, how the two have dovetailed. Now, in your interior design, when we um, uh, introduced you at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about the fact that you worked on Terminal 3. Uh, you've worked on, on several different um, uh, professional firms. You worked overseas. Is there one project that stands out in your mind as, as being your favorite or just most interesting? Well, obviously the the work in Kuwait was kind of <laughs> kind of amazing. It was a three hundred thousand square foot facility, which I was in charge of the planning and the execution. And I found myself on a plane, like every, in parts of the project, like every six weeks. So I got to the point, and then it was a twenty four hour commute, and with a layover in Germany and all this other good stuff. But it was fascinating to realize um, the differences in the cultures and how they interpret. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was an office structure really so the fundamentals of how you laid it out were not drastically different but the cultural impact of it was and Mm -hmm. the people that I was working with were very key to having what you visually saw as reflective of their culture so I found myself doing Islamic designs on fabric screens which were put into a panel system so a lot of stuff like that so yeah, that was kind of challenging. And also the fact that I had to have a completely new wardrobe <laughs> just to get into the country yeah. was also, you know, kind of one of those things. And you find yourself walking through a soup, a marketplace. And it, uh, it's just such an amazing cultural contrast. And this was, of course, years ago. And, you know, Western travel was not encouraged. And it was one that was both in the airports in Kuwait. And they progressed a great deal since then. but. Yeah, it was it was certainly interesting. The most fun project I ever had might have been a marketing firm in uh, Chicago, mm-hmm. which had taken over the top floor of what used to be the Playboy printing um, building, the building where they did the printing for Playboy. Not that that's relevant, but mm-hmm. as a result, there were all these skylights, but they were internal, and it it forced me as a designer to make, you know, typically I find myself breaking rules. I broke rules then and I'm breaking rules now. When we did O'Hare in the original plan, the footprint for those um, layouts was pretty much established. And it was established in like in the 1950s by C.F. Murphy, actually, ironically. And my principal had come to me and said, it's time to do something different. We're going to try this. And we basically turned the thing completely upside down over a weekend. And I was amazed that the concept that my team and I uh, conjured up in that weekend began to drive everything else that was done at O'Hare in the coming years. So that was kind of like, whoa. But I was such a baby at the time. <laughs> um, they they kind of sloughed over it and went, oh, yeah. And I remember being interviewed by the 
newspaper, I think it was the Tribune or something, that was going to do an article on the new concourse opening up. And they didn't put my name in it because they didn't believe that a female of my age could have generated that. Mm. And, and that kind of was like, really? Yeah. But it was, it was, I don't know, back to the August Bishop and Meyer thing, which was the marketing firm. I pushed everybody internal under these skylights and created an internal executive hub, which typically traditionally was always on the perimeter. Mm. So we gave the, the outside light to the so-called employees and then the um, principals of the firm, there were three, um, were all internal, but organized around these overhead skylights, which were in existing condition. So we broke a few rules um, many times. And it was fun. It was great. It was it was that edge, that creativity of, and that energy. And it's not much different now. Risk taker continues <laughs> into this. And and by the way, I'm sure uh, the, the Tribune did make that mistake. And people do know your name now. Maybe. Who knows? It's not important <laughs> to me anymore, you know. It's kind of like I'm just doing what I do. And it feels really good. So I don't um, worry about it. Speaking of names. I love the name of your establishment, A Different Box of Crayons. Um, How did you come up with this? Tell us why why your place has this name. It's great. Well, to be honest, as you might tell from even this conversation so far, um, it is literally just an extension of what I've been doing all along. There is a little bit of a homage to my childhood in that crayons were my absolute favorite thing to mess with. And my mom, I was a second child by five and a half years. So my mom, you know, I was kind of pestery. <laughs> I never hushed. And I can still remember her standing at the sink when I would come home from lunch. And I can imagine what her face must have looked like now as an adult when I reflect on it. Because I would just jab her. So she discovered that if she could give me a box of crayons, and if it was a new box of crayons, my Lord, I would be gone for hours <laughs> and quiet. So crayons, Uh you know, were my first coloring tool. They were my first creative tool. And I Mm -hmm. look at the things that I've done over the years. And as it's evolved, when I think about, and we just talked about it, this idea of how space planning overlaps into what I'm doing now, it's just a different set of tools. It's just, Mm -hmm. you know, the same thought process, but a different set of tools. So why not make it a different box of crayons? That's how it happens. You know, I, it's, it's a great story. It's, it's so fitting. I'd like to know what motivated you to, to make this career shift and open your store and tell us about this amazing farmhouse that you're in. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Um, it is. And there's more <laughs> coming. Oh, boy. <laughs> what motivated me to open the store? Well, as with most things in my life, it was a function of what life was throwing at me. The store evolved. I started doing pad design, as we've talked about, and started looking at this concept of mixed textiles. Um, and I really had no aspirations of having a store, especially a physical store. Lynn Rice, um, who owned A Touch of Amish, was my mentor. And I watched her for eight years um, deal with having a store. It's a lot of work. And I knew at that point, that I never wanted that store. I wanted to play. I wanted to create. I didn't want the responsibilities of retail. So, um, having said that, when I, <laughs> when life changed, um, I ended up moving from a 3,000 3, square foot house to an 1,100 square foot house. Supposedly as temporary, but that temporary extended mm-hmm. for another 10 years. Um, Mm -hmm. but when that, you know, I was working out of my home, I was doing shows, I was doing kits and patterns and I was being published and I was focused on getting things out and the concept out, not worried about having a place where people could come and find it. I had not evolved into a website that didn't happen until COVID, but, um, Mm -hmm. basically it was a question of space why we started the store because when I moved and ended up in an 1,100 square foot space versus 3,000. I had no room to basically live, much less work. So I decided I had to rent space, and I rented a room in another building in Wheaton, which is an adjacent suburb here, and um, I had a room, 
well, two rooms. One was my office and one was a so-called store. It was maybe 300 square feet. I mean, it was little, mm-hmm. it was tiny. And I had to basically strong arm the guy to rent it to me. And of course, I the building was empty. It was a 6,000 square foot building. But I rented two rooms in it and the rest of it was empty. So I would just ooze out into the lobby, into the room that was adjacent to me. And, you know, and he was kind and he would look the other way because nobody was actually in it. So he would be accommodating enough. And, you know, it worked out for a while. Eventually, um, he managed to rent the entire building. So I lost my lease. And then it was like, okay, now what do we do? And the reality is it's my husband who created this house because he found it. It was really small. Um, again, not much bigger than, you know, maybe maybe the house we were living in, maybe 1,200 square feet. And um, we looked at it and I thought, well, this is never going to house enough, but it's certainly bigger than what I have right now. And it had this awesome little um, coach house in the back, which was actually a coach house, literally a coach house for a one horse kind of deal because this house was built in 1890, as you said, that's 134 years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's been um, a home, it's been a store, it's been a studio for a fabric designer or a, a clothing designer. It's taken many manif- manifestations. And when I got it, it was like, okay, let's do this. Because I couldn't see myself going into a mall. There was absolutely no way with my interior background that I could exist with an acoustical tile ceiling and fluorescent lighting. I knew that that's just, if I was going to have a space, it couldn't be that space. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it just wasn't for me. So this happened. And when we bought it, as I said, 1890, and it was an old farmhouse, we found some of the story, the historical story on it. And you could track it. And there was some woman who was interviewed years ago, um, how she lived in this house and you know, I can't remember coming down the stairs, which at the time were like a goat, you know, <laughs> you need to be a goat because the risers on them were like 12 inches high. It was ridiculous. And the angle was absurd. We had to redo all of that. But um, it was just fascinating to start to peel it back because when we did go literally to peel it back, because I wanted to preserve as much as we could of the character of the building, because I believe walls could speak. You know, I, I used to, uh, drive down. There was. I remember one occasion I was driving somewhere in Lake Zurich where I used to live, and I saw a building being dem- demolished, and it was kind of half peeled back. And all mm-hmm. I could think about is if those walls could talk, the laughter, the mm-hmm. joy, the tears, if they could express and share. And I looked at this building and said, it's had the same kind of thing. I don't want to destroy that. I just want to kind of maintain what I can and make it functional for us and then build on it. And that's what we did. We peeled all the moldings off, put them back up, um, kept as much of the facade as we could as it it was when we fought it. Kept it red, because it's been known as the red house in Glen Ellen for I don't know how long, even though it actually Mm -hmm. was white, because we did peel it back and found some really mysterious stuff um, in the building itself. Found some cool stuff in the wall, uh, but you know, Aside from that, and my husband actually took a section of the um, the uh, what are those boards? The ship lap that you know mm-hmm. Joanna Gaines would be happy that I remembered that word. Um, <laughs> the ship lap that was underneath the siding, which was of course not vinyl; it was wood of some sort. And as we peeled it back, we realized that there was these big sections that had hundred-year-old dirt on it, and and that mm-hmm. to be preserved. So that is actually my husband took those boards. And many of the moldings and constructed our reception desk, you know, where we, our cash desk, where we cash everything mm-hmm. out. So he put those, preserved those, put them into the top of this thing. And it's just kind of cool to think about, again, those walls and what they could tell you if they uh, could speak. I think that, you know, you need to do that. You need to do that. I like doing it. Now, I've visited your store, um, and it is a wonderful atmosphere, and in, in, in you talked about the building. It's beautiful. And I really felt, Lynn, like I was visiting your home, and I watched your customers, and they seemed to treat this as a gathering place. Um, how did you create this warm and inviting atmosphere? What, what did you do for that? 
well, I guess I approached it. Uh, I do have an interiors background. So uh, I was adamant about there would be no fluorescent lights. There would be none of that kind of super commercial stuff. It had to be functional. So we basically created, we did a big addition to it. Um, and in so doing, that opened a huge can of worms in the village. But okay, we won't go there today. Um, mm-hmm. But I, to be honest, going, okay, first, think about it. I went from 3,000 square feet to 1,000, you know, 1,100 square feet. I had extra furniture. A lot of the furnishings that initially came into this building were things that I already owned. They were from my home. Um, we have wood floors and, and rugs. I don't have commercial grade carpets on the floor because that's the way I like to live. And so basically this is an extension of my home and it is my home away Mm -hmm. from home. So I want people to feel comfortable and I want it to be a place where they come to gather and enjoy. I don't, I am the world's worst retailer, to be honest. (laughs) I don't care. And why, why is that? I don't care if you spend 50 cents in my store. I mean, it'd be nice Uh and it keeps us alive, certainly. But um, I just want them to be, I want them to feel the energy that hopefully we can create by doing something different. And the walls, you know, like, you know, they just radiate color. I knew there had to be a lot of light in the space because I'd worked in other shops where it was dark and you couldn't really see what you were doing. You couldn't, and, and dark doesn't generate energy. Dark, mm-hmm. you know, creates intimacy, but it doesn't necessarily create energy. And I'm after the energy of all of this. And and you know, I just I wanted it to be that kind of a place, a gathering place. Quite honestly, the little house in the back was intended always to be a classroom, and it's very cool mm-hmm. back there. That and I kept as much again as I could. We basically peeled everything back to the studs to these two buildings, put in only windows, only doors. All new ceilings, all new walls, all new electrical, you know, all new, all new, all new. But I wanted to keep as much as possible. So in the back house, there are boards in the floor with square nails and 12-inch planks. You can't even mm. find these things anymore. And I wanted that. very. And we put French doors in and a little patio. And to be honest, I've yet to realize how that space was initially intended to be used. But I'm determined to get there. Maybe not tomorrow. Oh, well, I would invite anybody who happens to be around Glen Ellen, Illinois, to, to stop into your location um, because it, it is like going into your home. Uh, very warm, very welcoming. And now we've talked about the building, your location. I want to talk about what you have in your in your place. Um, it's colorful. Uh, it's warm. And you're right. There are no neon lights. It is very warm. And you you work with, and, and you call this eclectic textiles, and I'm going to quote you here, with a little understanding of how to handle and sew with eclectic textiles, quilters need not be limited to just cotton fabric in their projects. And you say many fabrics, I love this, can be brought together to dance in a single project. And you offer your wares as those many um, textiles that dance together. Would you talk to us more about this? I'd love to. It is. <laughs> it's a soapbox I stand on more often than not. Um, the different textures. Well, as you might imagine, if I can pull all these threads together for you, I had, you know, we call it a stash, right? A quilter where we gather mm-hmm. and we gather things that we love, not necessarily knowing what we're going to do with them, but we gather them. So as when I was doing interiors, you have to have an equal bounty of stuff. Um, a stash, if you will, different kinds of things, certainly, but a lot of that is textile um, because obviously you do the planning. You know, I, I tend to focus on the planning portion of the interior thing because that's where you sculpt the space, but you also have to finish that space. And there's textures and colors and finishes and all that kind of thing, which basically augments. So I had a huge stash of alternative textures. I had wool, I had silk, I had upholstery fabric. And I've I've listened to other designers talk about how they just didn't know that they weren't supposed to do it and they went ahead and did it. And look at this, it worked. And that was kind of how I stumbled into 
doing quilting. It was like I had all these fabrics and I thought, well, why can't I sew them together? And I did. And one thing led to another, and that's really shortening the curve on this a lot, but it was a matter of not knowing any better. I didn't know there were quilt police out there saying, no, must only work with cotton. And, mm-hmm. and I just, so I disregarded the rules and, and I just went, well, why not? And I recognized that there are some qualifications to how you use certain fabrics. Silk is one of my all time favorites, but you got to understand mm-hmm. that the nature of silk as a fiber is stronger than cotton and it will rip itself out of the seams if you don't pre-treat it. Wool has a nature of obviously being fabulous if you quilt it. And actually, quilters did use it years and years and years ago. Um, but it takes quilting like no other. But to seam it, you have to know how to handle it. And of course, there's various grades. So it's just a question of understanding new materials and what the limitations potentially of those materials might be. Mm-hmm. So I've kind of, I in the book that I did in 2017, um, I spoke to, it's, it, it's not a question of what you know. It's, it's what I, I made the mistake, so you don't have to. And I, and I had things that I sewed silk together and it ripped out of the seam. I didn't understand why, but then you just naturally go about trying to figure out how to prevent that. I discovered that a clapper was an awesome, and it's not the kind that you turn the lights on with. It's that heavy wood <laughs> thing, you know. Uh, the tailors use, I mean, again, I'm just, I am not inventing anything new. I'm just drawing back on what's already been done and kind of reinterpreting it and trying to mm-hmm. find a place for it in our world today because I, you know, I get a little bored with just the stuff that's generated as far as the rules, the so-called rules go. And it's lovely and wonderful. And there's so many fabulous fabric designers out there and manufacturers supporting it, but not too many who are actually looking at alternative fabric. We're doing velveteen right now. Um, as a background fabric in salmon, if you will, um, for a new project that we're working on, or it's a block of the month kind of thing, um, which is all about concepts. And it's kind of called, okay, I'm going to teach you these things and try to stretch your mind. That's what I want to do. That's what gets me excited. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's kind of, I don't know, if you have a few rules, not rules, guidelines, guidelines, that's the word. Mm-hmm. There's a few guidelines to go with how you can incorporate these fabrics. Why not? Question is, why not? Why not? Now, your current focus is on secondary patterning, color, textures, and eclectic textiles enhanced with wool applique. Tell us about that. Well, um, it, it, it doesn't even stop there, Meg. It goes on. Um, it, wool applique is, I want to bring cruel work, you know, so with yarn stitching with yarn. Mm-hmm. As I said, from my childhood, I did an awful lot of cruel work when I was uh, a kid. Ducilla was my friend. And um, I want to take these techniques and bring them forward and, and get them to work all together. Because, again, why not? I've been putting wool applique as detail elements, and it's a function of, <laughs> it's a function, of, it's so self-serving. I'm sorry. It's all self-serving. It's all about me. Um, I was not good <laughs> at needle turn applique, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm not a good needle turn applique person, but I found that wool, if I were to um, do a few things to it, basically became my friend. I had a clean edge by putting interfacing on the back of my wool before I cut it out and then re-pressing it before I applique it down. I am able to secure a very tight edge regardless of the weave of the wool that I'm working with. Some are looser than others by the nature of it. And I found that if I did that, I could get a nice clean edge. It didn't look primitive. And I had this awesome element of color and texture because it's not just solid colored wool. It's trunk tooth and plaids and, you know, whatever. Um, you come across and you just go, yeah, I, I can do that. And um, you know, just stretch it. I keep stressing it, not not intending to be a pioneer, mm-hmm. but just finding a way to do the things that I want to accomplish. If I want to accomplish this image in a certain style or feel, 
I have to find a way to do it. So I'm almost working back and forth. I'm looking at the end product, mm-hmm. even though sometimes I don't know what the end product is because it changes in the process. But you look at, I want to go here. How do I get there? And then you find a way. And that's kind of, I think, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but um, that's, that's kind of the way I approach most things. And so there's no boundaries. No, you definitely answered it. You, you pretty much live in the land of why not. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and we're, we're too often governed by, well, somebody said you, you shouldn't or you can't do that. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. why? Oh, <laughs> why? I mean, think about it. Crazy girls. Think about them. They were done in the Victorian era. They had everything in the world in them and on them. They had, you know, silks and velvets and upholstery fabrics. And it was kind of a social statement. Mm-hmm. That when these crazy quilt things would go around the neighborhood as a, like a collective project, everybody would put in their absolute best things that they could find because it reflected on them and their status. And then they would embellish with stitches and they applique and, you know, anything they could find and anything that spoke to them. So I'm not doing anything new. I'm just trying to corral it into our world today. Lynn, when when you and I were getting to know each other, you mentioned to me that you feel like a leaf in the wind and you're amazed at where life has taken you. Um, That's pretty interesting. Tell us more about that. Well, I think it probably goes to, um, there are many in our world who set goals and judge their progress based on achieving those goals. I have to tell you, Meg, I'm not sure I've ever really set a specific goal ever. Um, Mm -hmm. At least not not a one set in stone. I had some friends at one point, uh, or a girlfriend at one point, who had a group of friends, and they would meet every January and set their goals for the year. And and then at the end of the year, they compare if they had accomplished them or not. I looked at her like she had four heads. It was like, what? You did what? I mean, it's okay to have goals, certainly. I'm not advocating that you wouldn't. But I don't know, that's restrictive me i keep responding Mm -hmm. to what's put in front of me and i have to tell you i never planned on being a quilt designer i never planned on having a store i never planned as anybody looking at me as an innovator um and i haven't ever planned where i'm going with it i really am not completely sure what the next chapter is going to bring i'm responding and mm-hmm. just like even when I was doing interiors, people told me, well, you shouldn't be going to the Middle East. It's dangerous. And I went, is it? I don't know. I, somebody <laughs> said, here's an opportunity. Go. So I went. And that's kind of like if I see a new fabric or a new concept or a new tool, what can I do with it? So I just kind of go to whatever squirrel thing, you know, has entertained me at that moment. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure I probably have sure. ADD. Um, but it's never been diagnosed, but I do know that I'm much like my beloved Willie, who is a black lab with calf, but with the family dog. And, you know, he'd be sitting there very attentively and then a squirrel would run by and there he goes off in Mm -hmm. that direction. So I think we had a lot in common. What's the best part of your day? I think there's many best parts of my day. Um, I'm not sure I could identify one. I, I certainly enjoy it when the doors open on the store. Um, and we have customers come in because so many of them have become friends. I know most of them by name, um, well, at least by face, maybe not always by name, but always by face. And these are people who I am glad to see, and there's an energy. I love the energy of it all. I mean, I think that's consistent, mm-hmm. in, and I'm blessed in that regard, in that I've been given the opportunity to feed off of that. And so I am thrilled when they walk in the door. I have to admit, though, I'm glad when the door closes and I'm, I'm in my, my own space again. Sure. And I'm even happier when I get to go home to my husband and sit and have a glass of wine at the end of the day. So there's no one specific time of the day or event of the day that pleases me most. I think there's many. I think there's many. Mm-hmm. Lynn, what's next for you and what's your dream? Well, again, as you can tell, I don't have a specific dream per se, other than Mm -hmm. to have the grace or the opportunity, maybe that's all the same thing, to play and create. I think in the last six months, eight months, my customer base 
has told me what I need to do next. And that's to go back to basics and, and go back to doing me. I think I'm finally hitting that place in my life or career, my trip around the sun, where I now am beginning to see who I am and what I can expect. And that is to generate energy. And in doing that, I want to milk those creative juices, Mm -hmm. um, which is is kind of a catchphrase, which I don't intend to minimize. But it's like that energy within me gives me great joy. And I'm recognizing that people don't want me to do the same thing that everybody else is doing. I don't need to become the typical quilt retailer. Um, It never was my objective. And it's and I fell into that for a while. You know, we all got really scared during COVID and reverted to a place of, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, are we going to be able to make rent this month? Mm-hmm. Um, and so our focus became very financial and driven by that bottom line. And I think for a while I was in that too. I fought against it. And of course I, you know, the squirrel thing, I went off track many times. Um, and I'm not obviously going to be very good at that financial thing. So I've kind of like let it down and just gone, okay, I have to be responsible. But what my client base, I refer to them as clients more than customers, my friend base, the people who support this energy, um, they want me to do me. So I am going to dive deeper into what me really means and, and, and try to produce something that we can all embrace and if that means stretching the boundaries Mm -hmm. a little bit i'm all about it as i said we're starting this new foundation thing and it is literally that i think it's going to be an ongoing series where i just keep looking for how to stretch it how to give people permission Mm -hmm. to play to color to color outside the line um you know just to to grow what are we doing if we're not growing so that's kind of where i think i want to go indeed so in, a, in our conversation today, out of all that we've talked about, is there a question I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Well, I no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've covered an awful lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to say that my greatest joy in life is my family, um, beyond all else, my children. Um, they are precious to me, as is my husband, as, as was my cat, who I lost recently and and so i think that's Mm -hmm. core to who i am as a human um the rest of it is all wrapped up in what i do um and and that part is consistent and you hit on that heavily so i i think you got it i think you got it perfect well i i think we have a very good idea of of who you are and uh what a different box of crayons is and and means to people um I've so enjoyed talking to you today, and I want to thank you for um, joining us. My pleasure. Truly my pleasure. If any of our listeners would like to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, Probably through our website. We have a website, which is, as you might expect, www.adifferentboxofcrayons.com. Or uh, they can always email me at lynn at adifferentboxofcrayons.com. Um, at any time, that's the easiest way to find me. Phones, I'm not real good at. I'll warn you right there. But um, you can find me through printed medium. My, you know, the squirrely little brain of mine, as you might expect, unless I have a piece of paper in front of me, I am lost. Well, I'm sure that you will have people reaching out to you and um, they'll look forward to, to hearing back. Lynn, thank you again for being a part of, of so-and-so. Thank you, Meg. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. Another story about someone just like you, someone for whom sewing and quilting is so much more than a hobby. It's a way of life and a connection to something bigger. If you know someone who has an outstanding story, a story that should be shared on this podcast, please drop me a note to meg at soandsopodcast.com or complete the form on our website. Be sure to subscribe to review and rate this podcast on your favorite platform and visit our website, soandsopodcast.com, for more information about today's and all of our guests. That's S-E-W-A-N-D-S-O podcast.com. And finally, I want to thank Bernina for making this program possible. I'm Meg Goodman, and I look forward to you joining us next time on So and So. So and So.